Hi everyone and welcome back to Retail and this is chapter 4. Chapter 4 looks at retail institutions. <coughs> Excuse me, <laughs> my ownerships. I haven't talked in a while so it shows. Yes, uh, just to go back, it looks at chapter 4, Retail Institutions by Ownership. So let's look at the objectives really important to look at the objectives to show the ways in which retail institutions can be classified so it looks at classification uh, it looks at the study of retailers on the basis of ownership type and examines the characteristics of each and to explore the methods used by manufacturers wholesalers and retailers to exert influence in the distribution channel so wow that's pretty interesting when you look at that and again look at the in the context of today and uh, certainly uh, your your analysis and your point of view and your percept your perception of these three objectives in this chapter will change so please always pay attention to that and uh, always take in consideration of what's going on in the world today even more so now than ever so also as you can see below the screen there are subtitles welcome subtitles good for them subtitles are cool so here we go let's continue uh, classification method for retail in institutions you can have three uh, first is ownership second is store-based retail strategy mix that's a heck of a sentence right there and even more so number three non-store based retail strategy mix so let's look at all three forms ownership forms right well very oh we have some <clears throat> animation thank you so much for that uh, independent uh, chains certainly ownership forms or can be chains franchises like Tim Hortons uh, leased uh, departments in a store vertical marketing system that works uh, up and down uh, consumer cooperative also plays a big part so ownership as you can see uh, has different dimensions now if we look at independent retailers right in the states and again i'm following what we got here uh 2.2 million independent u.s retailers that's incredible and of course here it's always by 10 right the states is 10 times as, as big as us i don't know if they're 10 times as good as us as canadians but possibly i'm not going to say that but anyway it doesn't matter but around in canada this should be or it will be or there is 200,000 independent retailers 70% uh, of these are run by owners and their families and uh, again when you see these statements and uh, like this or these uh, these facts about what's going on or statistics that are going around the world take in consideration uh, what the pandemic has done uh, to the, our world and what has it done specifically to retail where people certainly cannot go into stores or well they're starting to reopen absolutely is that a good thing well we'll soon find out if reopening stores uh, is a good thing for our world or not time uh, it will tell and I must say that statement right there time will tell has never been more uh, true than it is today because in the next five minutes everything could change in the next hour the next day uh, next week and the next month so time will absolutely tell uh, where we're headed uh, as, as a world as a global world and uh, which takes in consideration just about everything else including uh, retailers and let's continue with the stats which might be a little bit off now but we'll stick to them so account for 35 percent of total stores and three percent of u.s uh, store sales so i would say that is pretty much the same here in canada 
Right. Only what the only it, the only difference really is the amount. We're about ten percent or ten times smaller uh, than the United States of America. And why uh, why is so many stores? Why is there so many stores in, when it comes to retail? Well, certainly the fact is you could easily open a store. One of the easiest things you can do here in Canada, uh, specifically, is to have your own business. When you are a sole proprietor, uh, it's very easy to do that and to start your own company uh, as a retailer, right? Selling products, exchanging products. Right, so ease of entry. Ooh, they have it in red, which matches the beautiful, let's give it to the beautiful background that we have here. You've got to give it to them. They really thought that through, uh, uh, through to give you uh, such a fantastic uh, background. And please don't pay attention to my sarcasm. Uh, it's got to do with the heat that we're going through, so I will blame that. Thank you. Let's keep going. So competitive state of independence, right? Oh, the, ooh, we start with the disadvantages of some, so they must have been, it doesn't really matter. We could start with the, I was going to start with the advantages, but really, okay, we want to start, oh, let's do that. That's fine. Disadvantages, uh, lack of bargaining power, right? If you are a small independent retailer, you don't have much bargaining power when it comes to purchasing product and also competitiveness when it comes to price and profit margins play a big part, right? So lack of uh, economies of scale, no doubt about it. When you, when you are independent, you don't have that, really small. And labor intensive operations, absolutely. Uh, you do need a lot of workers. And the big thing here that doesn't mention is the fact that uh, we live in a world of turnover and we have labor turnover, uh, which is just going wild. But I would say this is less and less true in the future with over two and a half million Canadians that just filed for unemployment. So get ready to pay more taxes because we have to pay for all those people that are out of work. I guarantee you that's just not going to go away. We are living in a situation for the next five years uh, that will be more expensive for everyone as a Canadian. Uh, over dependence on owner, right? The owner has to be there on, on site all the time and make sure the place is running very well. And uh, limited long run planning. So it's very difficult to make uh, long run planning uh, <laughs> only because you just don't know what the future will hold. And again, and I will keep repeating this till I am blue in the face, which I'm not, but. You know, if I was dressing for Halloween, I would probably, you know, dress as a blue man. Uh, what's that commercial about the Gaviscon? Blue man? No, I'm not sure. It doesn't really matter. But anyway, yeah, so uh, limited long run planning, no doubt about it. And today, uh, a lot of companies have gone bankrupt. And uh, no matter how well you've planned till the day that this pandemic struck the world, uh, Till that day, be it March 13th or was it March 1st or in that area, anywhere in the first couple of weeks of March, till March 13th, which is really something, if you think about it, uh, really st struck the hardest on the March 13th, which was a Friday. And Friday usually, you know, uh, you don't want it to, to fall under uh, Friday the 13th because that's such bad luck. And guess what? We, we went through the worst possible uh Friday, March 13th, or, or the 13th, you know, Friday, really something else. But anyway, so it's even worse now for people to even think about planning for the future. And again, like I said, if you had planned as perfect perfection, ideal perfection, uh, your future in retail up to that date, from that date on, no matter what, uh, certainly, uh, everything uh, is up in the air and uh, certainly uh, disastrous for a lot of retailers in our world today which have a lot of them have declared bankruptcy and a lot of them are seeking help just to survive just to even let you know i think we have a couple of students that uh, work for the liberal party of canada 
So let's just let you know that even the parties, uh, the, the actual parties themselves, uh, are seeking government help because they're not getting any funding from anybody. That's because no one has any more money to give. So even the parties right now uh, could could foreclosure <laughs> per se, uh, be it the Liberals, uh, PC, uh, Bloc Québécois, or uh, I forget the New Democrats, the NDP. They could also go bankrupt uh, anytime soon. As you know, also Aldo Shoes as a retailer uh, is pretty much gone. Oh, now we'll switch back to the other side, which is the advantages, which is so cool, right? So the advantages, uh, flexibility in formats, locations, and strategy, no doubt about that. Uh, control over investment costs and personnel functions. Again, you could work by your own if you are a sole proprietor, or you could hire and then fire as you will, as you wish. Uh, personal image, no doubt about it. The brand is you. The brand is the owner of the store. Uh, consistency and dependence, that's a good point. I'm not sure if that is an advantage or being consistent. It's very difficult to be uh, consistent. Uh, oh, I see my subtitles. That's a good point, mushroom. Oh, I'm not sure that's correct, but okay. Subtitles, sometimes they get to you, right? If you look there, good point, mushroom. Good point, mushroom. I'm not sure what that is. But it sounds like a rock band, right? It could be a rock band for sure. Good point, mushroom. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, here are the good point mushrooms. Dun, 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 dun. Anyway, I should stick to my day job. All right. So consistency, I'm not sure if that is an advantage, but surely, certainly uh, independence would be. Strong entrepreneurial leadership. Well, wow, there again, right? No matter how strong you are today, uh, a lot of companies have gone uh, on the wayside, no matter how good you are today. So... You need to have a fantastic plan, and I think it comes back to what we we talked about in the past, and what we should talk about for forever is learning to survive. Uh, the survival mode is going to be crucial for retail in the future. How to survive anything? How to survive a pandemic? If we can survive, a, if retail can survive a pandemic, it can survive anything. So the pivot plan, uh, again is front and center when it comes to survival uh, of the fittest in the future. So you need to be very, very proactive and re and, uh, and uh, act real quick on uh, certain situations that our world uh, never really expected to go through ever. Mind you, some did, some, some foresaw it, right? But it's hard to it's hard to say to foresee it and then actually it, it actually happens right and when it actually happens it's like oh, holy Toledo this is actually happening right now and it is and it's like still I can't uh, imagine what's going on in the world I just can't it's just it's just so difficult to imagine all right let's continue I can rant uh, rant all night but let's not do that so, useful online publications for uh, small retailers. There's a lot of information. As you can see, this presentation's got a lot to do with the United States of America. And unfortunately, so I will certainly not update this for Canada. Uh, time is out of an essence. And uh, as, we, as I said before, time will tell. Well, time is telling right now, that's for sure. Here we go. So store-based retail strategy mixes. Wow, that's a heck of a line. Think about that. Store-based retail strategy mixes. What are they talking about? I mean, I would, if I didn't know what I what I was talking about, I'd look at that and go, I'd just be totally confused. I'm not sure what that is. But here we go. So store-based retail. Oh, we're starting on the right again. A variety store is would be one. A traditional department store, so the department store has departments, which creates mix, right? So automatically, a department equal department store equals strategy mix. A full line uh, discount store, off price chain. That means uh, the prices have uh, been slashed. <clears throat> Factory outlets, for sure. Membership clubs, including Costco's. And the old flea and the pants markets, right? So the flea market 
is always going to be a strategy mix. Uh, so oh, again, oh, we're back on the other side. So then we're doing this backwards. We have convenience stores, conventional supermarkets, food-based superstores, combination. So we have so many ter terms and definitions that I, I'm looking at them. I'm not even sure I've ever been into a combination store. Hey, uh, let's go. Let's go shopping in a combination store. I'm not sure what that is. I, I have to be very honest. Uh, box store, warehouse, and yes, I've been to a specialty store, right? So chain retailers. Here are some here's some tidbits and information. Again, this is based in the old famous United States of America. Uh, operate multiple outlets under common ownerships is a chain. Engages in some level of centralized or coordinated purchasing and decision making. Walmart does that, and in the U.S. there are roughly 110 thousand retail chains operating about 800,000 establishments that's a lot of thousands right so if you cut that in tens right that by 10 uh, you'll see that you get the Canadian amount so uh, if there would be 11,000 retail chains here in Canada probably and operating about 80,000 establishments probably somewhere in that vein it's amazing how that 1 for 10 ratio really works for just about everything between us and United States of America. Uh, competitive state of chains. Uh, oh, we're back to advantages this time. Yes, bargaining, no doubt. The Walmart uh, will destroy pricing and will destroy profit margins uh, from you as a supplier just to get there to work to, to, to actually be on their, on their stores and their floors, right? Same goes for Costco and all these monsters. They go out there and they really slash profits of the smaller uh, suppliers. And it really is a hard, hard sell to get into. You got to be really good to get into uh, Costco's and the Walmarts. Uh, cost efficiency, no doubt. Efficiency from computerization is no doubt. Defined management philosophy. There again, uh, they really forced it to, on people to have a defined management philosophy, uh, but it's very difficult to do that from store to store, I guarantee you. Uh, considerable efforts in long run planning. Yes, there is a lot of effort in planning for the future. Again, uh, even more so today. Oh, we flip to the other side. We get disadvantages. And the first one is limited flexibility, uh, higher investment costs. <coughs> Excuse me. Also, complex managerial control. Yes, like I mentioned, when you have a lot of stores all over the country, uh, a great country like ours, Certainly, how you manage them is very difficult, and to have control is even more so. Uh, limited independence among personnel, that is so true. So there you see what you've got, the advantages and disadvantages of the state of change when it comes to competition. Uh, figure 4.3, we have the body shop. I'm not even sure if they're still alive. They probably are. So these are non-store based retail strategy mixes. Oh, that's a that's a mouthful. And then you add and non-traditional retail. So repeat that twice, uh, uh, you know, and see what happens. Not store based retail strategy mixes and non-traditional retail. A lot of nons here, right? Oh my gosh. All right. So what does that mean? Well, you've got direct marketing, you have direct selling, You've got machines, all kinds of vending machines. You have the internet, the world wide web. I remember when that first that first term came out. It was like in 1989 or something like that. World wide web. I was like, wow, what is that? You know, whatever you think about spiders, right? Actually, one of the first uh, search engines was called something like Spider something. I forget what it was back then. So, wow, spiders, world wide web. Uh, other emerging retail formats. This has all got to do with non-store based retail strategy mixes and non-traditional retailing. I wouldn't say that World Wide Web would be non-traditional today. I would think it would be the complete 
opposite. It is the tradition. Amazon is retail today. No doubt about it. Franchising, well, it's really got to do with contracts and agreements between a franchisor and a franchisee, uh, allowing the franchisee to conduct business under the established name according uh, to given a pattern of business. And if you don't, you will certainly lose that franchise. So franchisees pays an initiative initial fee in a monthly percentage and quite high if I, if I understood correctly if you want to buy a Tim Hortons uh, yes it's a great franchise man it's a lot of work uh, to own that store right uh, but if you if you like to work and certainly there's a lot of money to be made in owning a franchise right uh, formats here we have no animations uh, something's wrong but we will Look at that. For now, for franchise formats, we have on the left products and trademarks and the right business formats. So product uh, trademark franchisee acquires the identity of the franchisor. A franchisee operates autonomously and two thirds of retail franchising sales are this way. A business format franchisees receives assistance, location, quality, all of this from uh, the store or the franchise itself. So basically they buy the store and it's really run by the franchise. Uh, common for restaurants and also common for real estate. Let's pick up the pace. So business qualifications sought by McDonald's. Here's an example for potential franchisees. Uh, the ideal franchise needs to cover all these bases. So you can stop the uh, slide here and take a look at exactly what is sought for ideal, idealistic franchisee. <laughs> Certainly not the lack of a voice like I have now. Mm -hmm. uh, structural arrangements in retail franchising. You got the type of arrangement on the, on the left, manufacturer, wholesaler, and service sponsor. And on the right, you have certain examples. Manufacturer, retailer is General Motors. Wholesaler would be Radio Shack, which doesn't exist anymore. Just, told, just lets you know how, how long ago this, these slides were made, right? Quite a few years ago. And service sponsor retailer Hertz, which uh, I think has just gone bankrupt or pretty close to it. So the world has changed since they actually uh, made this slide. A lot of color in this slide. Really lots of color. All right. So wholesaler, retailer, structural range. I, I, I apologize if, I, if I'm smirking or um, laughing, but... Uh, these statements, try to remember them. If I'll ask you, okay, what does wholesaler, retailer, structural arrangements mean? I think you would probably just throw something at me and say, sir, Tony, you don't know what you're saying, right? Stop it. I've got a headache, right? So I, I would agree. I would tend to agree. So certainly I hope that there is not going to be any questions as such on these long, long drawn out titles. Speaking of long and drawn out, ooh, we're not even halfway there. So voluntary, a wholesaler sets up a franchise system and, and grants franchises to individual retailers. Cooperative is a group of retailers, co-op group. A group of retailers sets up a franchise system and shares the ownership. All right, that's so cool. Next slide, we have franchise and business opportunities. Again, we have a nice uh, American website here and I'll be curious to find out if this website still exists I don't know but probably and talks about uh, the business opportunities and franchise in the United States of America uh, competitive state of franchise okay, that's less less than a tongue twister so what are the advantages of co competitive state of franchise uh, low qua low capital required you don't need much money Acquire, you can actually acquire well-known names. I'm not even sure that's true because acquiring well-known names are expensive. Operating management skills taught. Yes, that's true. Some Most franchises will teach you. Um, cooperative marketing possible. Exclusive rights to the ownership of that. And overall, less costly per unit when it comes to a franchise. On the other side, we have disadvantages. Uh, oversaturation could occur. Oversaturation means there's going to be too much of them. That's true. Franchisers may overstate potential. In other words, they might uh, lie, give you some BS to get more. Not those bad franchises. 
uh, locked into contracts for the duration, no doubt. So be very careful before you sign on the dotted line, right? Don't sign on the dotted line. Be careful to do that. Uh, agreements may be canceled or void. Yes. Imagine, they hold you accountable for these contracts, but they can just cancel it anytime they want. It doesn't even make sense, but that's true. Uh, royalties are based on sales, not profits. <clears throat> so, from the perspective of the franchisor, right? Uh, oh, we're going back to the right side with animation. Hey, animation. You've got to give it to the animation, right? And there you got color coordination, right? Color coordination. So, potential problems, um, potential for harm to reputation, yes, indeed. Lack of uniformity may affect customer loyalty. You saw that in the movie from Donald's when he sold some franchises and they decided to sell fried chicken. They're like, what? Fried chicken? McDonald's? Yeah, but that was the case. So, yeah, it could be a problem if you don't have all your uh, franchise agreements correctly done in the contracts. Um, many defective franchise units may damage resale value, that is true, have potential limits to franchises rules, and that's it for the right side, which is potential problems. Benefits, well, your presence will be seen around the world, no doubt about it, and easily recognized. Uh, qualifications for franchisee operations are set and enforced, and you can have much more money at delivery. And royalties represent the revenue stream. All right. Now, if we look at uh, leased departments, not the least, <laughs> leased departments, rented departments, a leased department is a department in a retail store that is rented to an outside party. Yes, indeed. Right. That's exactly what it is. So the proprietor is responsible for all aspects of its business and pays. A percentage of sales as a rent. The uh, department store sets operating restrictions to ensure consistency and coordination. So the competitive, well, we're going back to the right side, competitive state of leased departments, potential pitfalls. That means that bad stuff that could happen to you in the future. They should have put that bad stuff that could happen to you in the future, right? Instead of potential pitfalls. That's, a, that's an alliteration, right? P, P. That's called an alliteration, when you use the same letter uh, over and over again in a sentence or in a statement. Uh, Lacey's may, neg may negate store image, yes, uh, same as before, and retail procedures may conflict with department stores, and problems may be blamed on department store rather than the leasing. On the other side, the benefits, yes, provides one-stop shopping for customers, no doubt. Uh, Lisi's handled the management part of it and the store uh, reduces store costs and it does provide a stream of revenue. Now, vertical marketing systems. Now, this is an amazing part of retail sales, right? Independent channel system and the functions are manufacturing, wholesaling, and retailing. The ownerships are independent manufacturers, independent wholesalers, and also independent uh, retailers, okay? So, partially integrated channel system, the functions, again, manufacturing, wholesale, and retailing. Here, the ownership is a two-channel member, own all facilities, and perform all functions. Totally different. And you've got also fully integrated channel system, Functions, again, are the same, but the ownership, again, is different. All production and distribution functions are performed, not by two channels, by only one. All right, we're almost done. Actually, we're done. This is a system, vertical marketing, when it comes to Sherwin-Williams. They sell paint, right? So you've got a vertical marketing system on one side, Sherwin-Williams brand of paint. Company-owned store sells directly to customers. On the other side, Dutch Boy brand of paint, independent wholesalers sell to home improvement stores, full line discounts, and also customers. So this is basically one customer dual vertical marketing system. So Sherwin-Williams owns Dutch paint for Dutch Boy. Well, great. That was, uh, that was really interesting, and I hope that you got something out of it. Uh, certainly the subject matter at times can be less than illuminating, and uh, less than being provocative. But 
the only way this could be provocative and could entice you to learn more about uh, this is if you put it into the future of our world. So when you do that, you realize the importance of this when it comes to strategies and retailing in the future. I wish you all a great time and we'll see you later.